You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. This is 12 Newsmakers. We're here because we're against the whole matter of giving special rights to homosexuals. There is a large group of fervent Cincinnati citizens drawn together by a common belief that they know what is best for the rest of us. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. It began in 1992. City Council passed a human rights ordinance that outlawed discrimination in the city's workplaces, housing, and public facilities based on race, gender, age, color, religion, disability status, sexual orientation, marital status, ethnic origin, or Appalachian regional origin. The sexual orientation provision sparked the drafting of Issue 3 for the 1993 November ballot. Issue 3 rewrote Article 12 of the city charter so that the city may not pass any legislation to protect people based on sexual orientation. Issue 3 won easily, leaving many people, especially in the gay community, vowing to challenge and overturn the measure. And we shall not give up the we have only started, we have only started, we have only started. The ordinance was challenged in the courts, but upheld. Now a group titled Citizens to Restore Fairness has formed to challenge Article 12 with a new charter amendment. I am joined this morning by two people representing that effort. Gary Wright is the co-chair of Citizens to Restore Fairness and oversees the Global Trends Groups for Procter, Ga Procter & Gamble. Robert Harris is a program officer with the National Conference of Community and Justice, the NCCJ. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank Good morning. Um, let's begin by just focusing on exactly what the goal is of your organization. What, what are you setting out to do? Citizens to Restore Fairness only has one purpose, and that's to repeal Article 12. Um, Article 12, unfortunately, uh, makes the city of Cincinnati stand out as the only city in the nation with a law that discriminates against gays and lesbians and promotes discrimination against gays and lesbians. Our only mission is to get that law off the books so that we can get back to fairness and equality for everybody in Cincinnati. It's unfortunate that, um, uh, it, that in 1991, actually 1992, the city of Cincinnati had a law, had a human rights ordinance, which protected almost everyone from discrimination. It wasn't just about gays and lesbians. There were lots of people protected by the ordinance. There were those nine categories exactly. that I mentioned. And what that law did was it meant that um, it protected gay people along with everyone else from discrimination on the job and in housing and in accommodation. And unfortunately now, we are uh, 10 years later, um, about five years actually since the Supreme Court refused to rule again on Cincinnati's Article 12. And um, you know, we're setting out right now to, um, to change that law and get it off the books and get it back to fairness and equality. Robert, you're with NCCJ. Yes. Mm -hmm. Who's involved in this effort? It, how broad is this effort to repeal Article 12? Well, I dare say it's pretty broad. Of course, NCCJ is involved because our whole mission is to fight bias, bigotry, you know, and, and prejudice on all forms and to make America a better place for all of us. So we're involved. The, the gay, lesbian community, of course, is involved. Uh, we are involving churches. We are involving uh, organizations of all types of anyone of good faith and goodwill is, who's willing to, to step up to the plate is welcome. Everyone is welcome. One of the things that, and we're, we're going to put up the website later so that people can look at this, but when you look at the board of directors, mm -hmm. it is not just people from the gay, lesbian community. It's people from all walks of life in Cincinnati that are represented here. Uh, absolutely. I mean, some of the names people might know, there's uh, Bob Gorski, an executive of Procter & Gamble, Ann Zarings, who's on the NCCJ board, a young man named Chris Seelbach, who's a, a law student, Scott Knox, an attorney in town, Sharon Zeely, very Zealand. Prominent, yeah. prominent civil rights attorney. And um, the board is not the whole story of CRF. I mean, CRF really is made up with, of the people who've got the heart and the soul to help us um, overturn this unjust law. And that's hundreds of people already and hundreds of people more every day. What's it going to take to get this on the ballot? What do you have to do to get it on the ballot? We have to have about uh, 9,500 9, valid signatures in order to get the um, issue placed on the ballot. 
um, as you probably and know, those Dan, are signatures from people who live in the city of Cincinnati, exactly. right? Exactly, because it's a city issue. It's a city issue, okay. and it's um, so the the city voters are the people who are going to help us put this on the ballot, and those are the very same people who are going to help us overturn it. We we're setting a target for ourselves of eighteen thousand signatures to make sure we can you know that we're we're confident we're going to have the number of signatures. We've got four thousand now, and we'll be working steadily to get. Um, those signatures to get this placed on the ballot. At the same time, what we're doing is we're talking to voters one-on-one. -on -one. We think that it's very, very important that we spend time to put ourselves out as individuals and as fellow residents of the city of Cincinnati to explain what this issue is really about. And it really is about fairness. It really is about discrimination. It really is about trying to make this city the kind of place that um, really reflects its true values, which are, in fact, um, value, values of tolerance and diversity. Robert, so then, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, just going along with that, I, I, I think that education is what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. And we are already engaged in that process of, of helping people to become educated on the issues. And I myself, uh, with, in our last election, uh, worked the polls and had people to sign petitions. And I'm happy to say that, that the, a good population, a good portion, of the population has educated themselves and is being educated as to the validity of, of getting rid of Article 12. One thing I want to keep, get clear, what will your charter amendment do? Will it just remove what is now uh, um, uh, Article 12, which is what was d passed in 1993, or will it remove that plus put in language about protection of various groups? Uh, this this charter amendment is just to repeal Article 12. So I mean, it, it'll send it back to council, in effect. It, it, it will it, allow council to make a yes. decision. Yes, and, and what we've seen since, I mean, 1993 is actually a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, we've had, we are now surrounded actually by cities who have charter amendments like the one that Cincinnati was proud to have in 1992. And it's a shame that we lost that. Covington we, most recently. Covington most recently, but also Louisville, Lexington, Columbus, Cleveland. I mean, we are surrounded by cities that have favorable laws. Well, one of the things that I found interesting was that as I went back and looked at the old stories um, that we ran at the time, a number of people who supported issue three uh, made the point that the Supreme Court had ruled just seven years earlier about that sodomy could be made illegal. And of course, just last week, we now have a new ruling about, about that. And so, in a sense, a fundamental change on the federal level, on the court level, really changes the context of, of what was just a decade ago. That's really, actually, and that's really just the latest of a whole series of changes. And we're, we're naturally very encouraged that the Supreme Court ruled that you know, these two gentlemen for Texas are entitled to their dignity and they're entitled to their right to privacy, because that's what that is about. And so you know, the, the people who are arguing that this is about anything but discrimination are, just in some sense don't get it. Um, I think it's telling, actually, that the other side has sued the city on the basis of um, a recent hate crimes ordinance, which merely protects gay people from harassment. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming clearer and clearer that the hardcore opponents of this kind of fairness in this city really want to allow discrimination against gays and lesbians. And that that goes all the way to saying that we would rather see people get away with harassment of gays and lesbians instead of having them protected. And that's the story I think that's going to, to win a lot of voters. And I think that's also important to add to that story in terms of, of hate crimes, uh, that the number one group is African Americans, the number two group is Jews, and the number three group happens to be gay and lesbian people. And that is very, very shocking. And that's also the byproduct of saying to someone, you don't have a right to even approach your government for protection. Robert, in 1993, one of the groups that was prominent pushing for issue three was the Baptist Ministers Association. NCCJ, given its origins, uh, mm -hmm. has there been any face-to-face -face discussion about where the Ministers Association will be if this comes back up on the ballot? That is in, in progress. You know, we haven't done uh, what I would call a face-to-face -face with the entire organization. 
We have talked a little bit with some individuals and we are in the process of coalition building uh, and especially reaching out to the Baptist ministries and other religious organizations because it's essential. And again, part of it is education to, to help them to understand what we're really asking. Mm -hmm. You know, not what someone said that we're asking, but what we're really truly asking. And then I think that many of them will, will buy into that. In the, process, in the, the years that have gone uh, in between the, the passage and where we are now, NCCJ has put on several workshops and several uh, talks whereby we've had the religious community come in, not only representing Baptist, but Catholic and Presbyterian, and they have actually uh, spoken in favor, you know, of repealing such legislation. So we're you making know, promise, we're promising. We, we, in that setup piece, uh, we pan down to the results of that election. That election was not close. It, no. Issue three won easily. One of the things, I know there's been some studies that mm -hmm. have been done about whether this is even possible, and in talking to people about those studies, one of my points is you probably only have one crack at repealing this, of turning this around. What makes you believe that within the next 14 months or so, that if you got this on the ballot, if you got those 9,500 signatures, that you could then get a majority of people to actually vote for this. Do you have any data that supports that? Yeah, yeah I, I'll just cite some of the numbers from last year. NCCJ was involved in a, in a study by, that was conducted by Fallon Research that showed that uh, about a 60%, 60-40, basically the reverse of the 1993 um, results in terms of favoring repeal of Article 12. I, I think those numbers are encouraging, but I still think it's a much tougher battle than that. We're finding that 60% of the people that we talk to, of the voters we've talked to so far in the streets, on their doorstep, on Election Day, also are supporting repeal of, of Article 12. And 70% of the people that we're talking to are willing to sign the petition. Mm -hmm. So um, what we know is if that, uh, unlike 1993, if we take the time and respectfully talk to people and explain to them what this issue is all about, that more and more of them get it. And we're also seeing things like in the environment. I mean, just the other day, um, not only was it a Supreme Court case, but Walmart, the largest corporation in the world, added sexual orientation to their non-discrimination policy. And the city of Cincinnati can't even do that. And now, nine out of 10 of the largest companies in the world, and, and my company, Procter & Gamble, did that in 1993, now say discrimination against anyone is wrong, and that's the message that we're going to get out there. Has there been, I know this is going to be a question, has, uh, since 1993, ha are there documentable incidents of discrimination against people because of, of sexual orientation in this city? Yes, I think if you went back to the, um, the hate crimes trial, a lot of that is, um, a lot of what happens is it's harassment or it's low level, um, kind of disparagement of, of you as a person because of your perceived sexual identity. I have talked, I don't know if this has been since 93 or not, but I've talked to people who've been told at work that they would not be promoted because they were gay. Um, so there are such incidents. And to tie it over, there's, uh, this is not about um, hate crimes. This is about repealing Article 12. Mm -hmm. But the last murder of the year in Cincinnati was a, clearly an anti-gay crime. And I don't think people are really aware of that. And what we're talking about is creating an atmosphere that is tolerant and welcoming of everybody, and repealing Article 12 is a key part of that. And I think then also you can really see, people have been able to see over the years the adverse effects of having this piece of legislation on the books. You know, just in terms of the lost revenue uh, of conventions that have canceled out specifically because this is discriminated against their people who would be coming here. Well, I'm, I'm running out of time. Let mm -hmm. me, a couple of quick things here. One, when do you expect this to actually appear on the ballot? We're targeting for November 2004, and we think that's the... Uh, Presidential the, election year. That would be the amount of time it will take to us to talk to enough voters one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I think what we're really trying to do, A.G. Laffley, my CEO, and the, the, uh, pre, you know, the CEO of Procter & Gamble, now the head of the, the new Cincinnati uh, Center City Development Corporation, said the other day, you know, what we need to do is take Cincinnati from being a good city to being a great city. <laughs> and no great city can tolerate discrimination against anyone. If people would like to learn more about uh, Citizens to Restore Fairness, you can check out the website at www.citizenstorestorefairness, all one word, dot org.
thank you for being here this morning. And obviously, as this develops, we'll have you back and, and follow this. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Stay tuned. The 4th of July weekend is filled with parades and fireworks. It should also include some reflection on the significance of the American Revolution. Welcome back. The United States was born in revolution. As we have matured, especially as we became a and then the world power, it has become harder and more uncomfortable to recall our origins as a people who challenged and overthrew the status quo. One manifestation of that is the transformation of all of our national holidays into Veterans Days, where we celebrate wars, victories, and fallen soldiers. That is particularly destructive on the 4th of July, which is about the American Revolution of thought and social principles that percolated over decades and crystallized in the 1770s and 80s, and not so much about the military affairs of the War for Independence. Joining me this 4th of July weekend to talk about the American Revolution is Roger Fortin, the Academic Vice President of Xavier University. Roger came to Xavier in 1966 to teach American colonial revolutionary history. Over the years, he's inspired many of his students to follow in his footsteps, including me. So for whatever, <laughs> whatever I turned out, Roger, you either can take credit or blame. But thank you for being here this oh, morning. Man. It's a pleasure. When you think about the American Revolution, and I think when lots of people think about it, they instantly start thinking about battlefields and whatever. In your mind, what's the difference between the American Revolution and the War for Independence? Well, the War for Independence was clearly a break from England. But the, the war also affirmed what is probably the most significant event in Western history in the past 300 years. The American Revolution is more significant than any other revolution we've had in the past three, 400 years because it affirmed the rights of man. So the revolution, in the words of uh, John Adams, for example, uh, when he reflected upon it 40 years later, this man lived to live a long, long time. Right. So 40 some odd years after the revolution, he said, you know, what was the American Revolution? He said, was, it was a significant change in the principles, opinions, sentiments, and values of the American people. That was the real American Revolution. So the war for independence was critical. Without separating from England, this country would not have been given birth to the richest set of ideals in, in Western history. And when you talk about those ideas in terms of, of the, the rights of man, it's more than just about um, the colonials being taxed too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's not just about taxation and taxation without representation. It goes much deeper than that, much more sweeping than that, right? Absolutely. For example, they, they, when I say they, the architects of the American Revolution, the one who wrote the documents, the one that, that, that led the, the revolutionary movement, they made it very, very clear that they were undertaking something that was radically different in the sense that no longer should man be investing authority in a king, in a tyrant. Rather, invest authority in the people. Having said that, they believed, they, they assumed two important things, that virtually every person is morally fitted to live in society, and second, is educable. Invest authority in the people so that they can rule themselves. This is a radical principle. Europe was unfamiliar with that in terms of governmental uh, procedures. So what this country initiated is a movement that is, has gradually spread in Europe throughout the next three centuries. Well, you know, a lot of people, I think, when they think about revolutions, they think about the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, mm -hmm. in our own times, the Iranian Revolution, mm -hmm. all of which were accompanied by you know, sweeping tears, purges, the American Revolution doesn't seem to have that same sort of bloodbath involved, mm -hmm. except for fighting the British. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what does that tell us about the American Revolution? Does that tell us this wasn't a real revolution? You're saying it's the most, most important event in the last 300 years in mm -hmm. terms of revolutionary mm -hmm. thought, yet it doesn't seem to be accompanied by a lot of the things that people frequently identify with revolutions. Yeah, I probably wouldn't be saying that it's the most radical revolution in the past 300 years unless I knew that there were Pulitzer Prize winning historians who were saying the same thing, like Gordon Wood, for example. Uh, what, what's significant is that it initiated uh, a, a process in which dialogue was critical in, in bringing about change. So there was tension. 
not everyone agreed that authorities should be investing in, in, in every individual in the same way. They, they, they took exception. For example, uh, Jefferson believed that man was basically good. John Adams believed that man was basically evil. Yet they both agreed that if man has sufficient education, he or she would be able to rule themselves better. Now, having said that, they believe the best investment that this new society could, could make to avoid the sort of bloodbath that you were talking about, to avoid the kind of overthrow of government, is to educate the masses of the people. And to me, of all the letters that Jefferson wrote, he wrote over 25,000 of them, the most significant letter is when he wrote to a friend in Virginia, George Wythe, in which he said, preach a crusade against ignorance. Hmm. That he said that the investment you make in the education of a person is no more than one-tenth what you would make if you, you allow tyrants to rise among us. To, Educate the masses. To remember that cast all of our discussions about schooling and uh, support for schooling mm -hmm. in a completely different light. It's mm -hmm. not just about taxes and teacher salaries. It's right. about democracy, freedom, and the American identity. Mm -hmm. Right. It's really an interesting. Yeah. You know, they had a tremendous sense of civic responsibility. Uh, if you're, go you're going to have more civility in society, the more educated the people are. One of the, uh, probably the most famous sentence in the Declaration of Independence, I want to read this right. because I know you've thought a lot about this one phrase. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. That last element, mm -hmm. pursuit of happiness, what is that? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? And how does it relate to maybe the dynamism of the American Revolution's continuing influence? Yeah. Well, interestingly, about two decades ago, I wrote an article on the pursuit of happiness. And um, it, what, what it means to me, based on my reading of the uh, writings of the founders of the nation, is that they believe that every single individual should be able to develop his aesthetic abilities as fully as possible. And I do not mean that a person should have the freedom to pursue any kind of pleasure. The term pursuit of happiness referred more directly to a person's ability to develop his potential as fully as possible. So that's what it meant. So, and it, it, now the tension, I think, I, what I would like to point out, the tension that was evident from the very beginning was something that came about in the year 1776. You have the Declaration of Independence, which speaks about political freedom. Mm -hmm. That same year, Adam Smith came out with The Wealth of Nations in which he celebrates the importance of economic freedom. This society subscribed to, the, to both of these documents. So there were individuals who believed every single person should have political freedom, but also every single person should be able to pursue his economic uh, interests as fully as possible. There evolved the tension. From that point on, this society had to wrestle with how best to allow each individual to pursue his freedom, but at the same time care about the, the, the general welfare of the public. So for an individual to pursue his self-interest as fully as possible was consistent with the tenets of the Declaration of Independence. But as we all know, being imperfect, man can sometimes abuse that. And that's a tension that this society has been living with for two and a half years. But it's a tension that is much better to wrestle with than the sort of revolutionary overthrow of governments that we saw in, in, in mankind before that. Mm -hmm. but, that's, but the ideals of the revolution clearly articulate the importance of balancing individual development and social responsibility. In that pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. I mean, is there also, I think of, it echoes to me, some of what Hannah Arendt has written about, mm -hmm. about the ability and the right of people, the responsibility of people, to enter the public space, to mm -hmm. be public people, not just to be individuals, not just to fulfill themselves individually, but if you're going to really pursue your happiness, you have to you have to be out there in the public. You have to be in dialogue mm -hmm. with the community as a whole. You have to, you have to really be committed. Is there, is there an element of that for you, too? Yes, there is, very, very much so. Uh, and, and frankly, there's, there's, a, there's evolving a rich literature on, uh, on the whole notion of, uh, of what civic and public space mean. Uh, it would seem to me that we've underestimated the importance of public space to facilitate exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think... Um, there will be some improvement in that area, but it's too soon to know what that will be. We're almost out of time. One thing I want to put up is some authors that people might want to pursue if they're interested. People like Bernard Balin, 
Pauline Mayer and Gordon Wood. If you're interested in this, there are rich books out there. There's rich literature on the American Revolution. Roger, thanks for being here. Thank thanks you. for all you've done since 1966 to educate the people of this city. And we really appreciate that and what you're going to do in the future Thank as you, ABP. Man. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Have a good 4th of July weekend and join us again next week.